So right from the start, before really diving in, I want to say that Remnant from the Ashes is a game that I will be devoting a significant amount of time to. That doesn't mean that I'll be covering it non-stop with guides or live streams or anything like that, but it means that the game is of a quality and caliber that interests me and will provide dozens more hours of entertainment because I have not as of yet unlocked anywhere near all of the items, weapons, traits, and secrets that the game has to offer, and I'm rather excited to do so. That being said, I now have more than enough understanding of what the game is to do my basic review, and I can preemptively say that it will be an extremely positive assessment overall. Remnant from the Ashes is a third-person, loot-based shooter set in a post-apocalyptic world and developed by Gunfire Games, the creators of Darksiders. I have seen a lot of comments directly comparing the game to Dark Souls with the insinuation that it is essentially a Dark Souls game with guns, and while that comparison is true in some aspects, in others it is not entirely accurate. To begin, let's focus on story. I never really care for story in games like this that is entirely personal and also highly subjective, but when a game includes any sort of loot-based progression or RPG leveling systems, I find myself disregarding story in favor of character progression. That being said, Remnant does have a storyline that is worthy of at least moderate interest. It's not Shakespeare, but it is a $40 game that has some fairly well-fleshed-out characters, a few interesting developments, and certain elements of choice that are very impactful and will modify your individual experience based on what you choose. In an industry where false choice is all too common, think Anthem with its dialogue choices, which were just a sham and meant absolutely nothing, to have legitimate choice which can introduce or avoid entire boss encounters, it can be very refreshing. On top of this, the game strives to create true replayability. At its core, Remnant is a linear co-op or single-player experience, and with such a format, replayability is generally a difficult feature to construct. For Remnant, however, the framework has been changed, and as a result of that change, it is clear that the game could be played numerous times with an entirely different overall experience. The key to this is procedural generation. When you set out to explore the world of Remnant, you will be entering into a procedurally generated tile set of maps. Each of these maps is taken from a pool of possibilities, and those possibilities contain unique NPCs, items, and even bosses or rewards. On my playthrough, I encountered a boss at a somewhat early stage who rewarded me with a mod called Swarm for my weapon, and it completely changed my entire playthrough because of its sheer power. It was insanely fun to use, and I ended up running a reload speed and damage-based mid-range build setup purely because of what was given as rewards from boss fights. But other players who pick up the game will have an entirely different experience, with separate rewards from different boss encounters spread across multiple unique map layouts. The result of this procedural generation, which is done quite well, I might add, is extremely appealing replayability. It might not be infinite, I suspect that you will quickly, on even your second or third playthrough, begin encountering repeated boss archetypes or tiles, but it creates a much more robust sense of content than a simple linear storyline that is exactly replicated upon every new game. The character progression is also extremely individualized. Since boss encounters reward a unique item drop, and item drops are tied to different mods, weapons, or pieces of gear, and not only that, but there are 30 different character traits, which are unlocked after certain quests, objectives, or feats, the character progression has a sort of living growth to it that yet again varies on a subjective personal level based on how your individual game is unfolding. I have not as of yet unlocked the full number of traits in the game, but it is entirely possible to construct sniper builds, crit builds, shotgun and close range builds, and many more possibilities by tying together certain traits, mods, and weapons. Additionally, the process of leveling, as far as I can tell, is uncapped. This means that over time, as you play certain areas and progress through various encounters, you can level every single trait that you unlock to its full potential, which eliminates the stress of re-rolling characters based on poor choices early on, which is a phenomenon many similar games suffer from. Feeding back into this idea of one character always being able to adapt, the game appears, at first, to feature a class system, with an initial choice of close, mid, or long-range gear. But immediately after that choice, a player can buy and equip any piece of gear in the game, so nothing is really bound by class archetype or character selection. As you begin to explore the world, for anyone who has played a Dark Souls game, a familiar checkpoint system becomes visible. You very quickly discover your central hub, which is called Ward 13, and from there utilize the artifacts to traverse the map segments, much like a Dark Souls game would do, which is one of the many reasons why the common comparison now exists, citing this as Dark Souls with guns. Unlike Dark Souls, however, and unlike many other games on the market right now, Remnant makes a deliberate effort to condense its control scheme. Now, on PC, I have heard this is less of an issue, which is totally fair, and I cannot really speak to its polish on that platform since I mostly played on Xbox primarily, but one of the control scheme choices was to tie the melee attack to the same button that fires your weapon. 
The game simply does not have hip fire, and when scoped in, the trigger fires your gun, and when not scoped in, it swings your melee weapon. This is not a good system, at least not on console it's not. The melee swings are slow, and if you're trying to rapidly switch between weapon types, which is a very common thing, owing to the limited ammo and the way that mods and skills work, while also trying to quick scope in for an important shot, it can frequently result in a long melee swing animation, which will absolutely get you killed in a lot of circumstances. On top of this, there are numerous bugs and glitches. I find myself battling against a few different bosses which would simply disappear, or get stuck walking in place, and completely break the fight. Worse yet, I encountered a glitch with the final boss of the game, and I won't show any spoilers here, don't worry, I feel like that would be unfair to do, where a certain phase simply didn't have the required mechanic, it glitched out and didn't show up, so it created an automatic death which reset the whole encounter. When things were working properly, these fights were extremely engaging and very fun, but the number of times they became dysfunctional or stopped working entirely was a little higher than felt comfortable. Another minor point of criticism is the sheer number of encounters that rely on infinite trash mob spawns to inflate difficulty. There were indeed a number of bosses that did not hinge on this mechanic, but the majority of the ones that I found in my initial playthrough would have a constant stream of enemies alongside the actual boss itself, which mostly ended up being a decent way to replenish ammo, honestly it did or force movement throughout the room, but sometimes it became a bit overwhelming and repetitive if it became back-to-back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back fights with the same detonator enemies constantly rushing you. The character progression is simple, but has a decent amount of depth to it as well. On top of leveling whatever traits you prefer and unlock, there is crafting and upgrades based on resources that are either found or dropped by enemies. For special boss weapons and mods, the required upgrade material is special crystals dropped by harder enemies that spawn randomly throughout the world, and for other standard items there are various tiers of iron from regular to forged, galvanized, and hardened. From what I was able to test, it appears that co-op gameplay with up to two friends for a total of three players on the team increases enemy health and damage. However, because of the procedural generation, I was not really able to test whether or not enemy spawn types and locations are altered as well, which would be a good addition, but as of now, I'm uncertain how to truly test that, since areas are never really the same for a direct comparison. The game is perfectly viable as a solo player. I played the vast majority of my time as an individual and found that by and large it is balanced quite well for that type of playthrough. However, I was not able to find an effective way to manually save before meaningful choices. So when confronted with a rather impactful decision, I was stuck making it once and then potentially hard rebooting my console if I wanted to undo it, but there was no simple way to try all of the different avenues which would be slightly preferable to emphasizing a total replay just for one alternate decision. By and large, the game is extremely fun to play. For its price tag, currently sitting at $40 as of this video, I am comfortable recommending it to anyone who thinks that they might have even a passing interest in the gameplay, and it bears mention that there were some shenanigans in the pre-release phase, with a VIP early access weekend available for all three platforms, at least it was advertised that way, in the pre-order bundle, but the PS4 version had its access stripped away at the very last minute, which is not good to see, but overall it appears to be a well-deserving title. When it comes to monetization, there was none to speak of from what I could tell. This is not to say that it will never exist, I wouldn't even begin to go down that road. We unfortunately now have a trend in the industry of waiting until a positive review cycle has passed before adding in more predatory monetization techniques, but as it stands, the game is very straightforward. Pay the initial price and enjoy it, no strings attached. Overall, Remnant from the Ashes is an exceptional example of value. The replayability, usage of procedural generation to ensure maximum content scope, and depth of character progression combined to create an experience that is more deserving than most $60 games on the market today, for a significantly reduced price on top of that. Anyone with even a passing desire to check it out should strongly consider picking up the game, especially given its social value as a true co-op title. The bulk of my criticism hinges on glitches and broken boss fight mechanics. I would not consider the story to be a monolith of drama or artful writing, but it gets the job done, especially when compared to other competing games. And once the plethora of glitches and bugs have been ironed out, which I would hope to be sooner rather than later, it will be a top-to-bottom example of what should be expected from all game releases. My final rating would be an 8 out of 10. Depending on your personal experience and the number of problems encountered, this could range from a 7 if a large number of bosses end up being broken, to a 9 if you get a great set of tiles and fantastic rewards and a smooth experience in terms of functionality. I can easily recommend the game as a fun, innovative title that takes risks where a great many of those risks paid off.
But that's it. If you want to support the channel, there are links down below. Memberships, merch, stuff like that. But I'll cut it there and stop rambling. Remnant from the Ashes is a great game. And as always, thank you all for watching and have a nice night.